Um, I'm excited for this. I got all my little materials up. I got my, my answers <laughs> to your to your questions. It should be a good one. It's probably going to go off script, and I'm okay with it. Oh, it's definitely going to go off script. I mean, there's no <laughs> question about that. Let's kick this thing off. I, uh, I appreciate you, you joining. Excited to have you on. It's been too long. Uh, I feel like I've been waiting on this moment for like weeks, dude. <laughs> and it keeps getting pushed back and pushed back. It's finally here. The it's finally here, here, man. That's right. That's right. Well, well before, we, before, before we jump in, I, I'm going to let you introduce yourself. Um, let everybody know, you know who you are, what you're up to, even you know, what, what's up with user gems. And then, uh, and then we, can, we can jump in. Yeah, uh, what's up, everybody listening to this or, or watching this? I'm Braxton Carr. I'm the uh, head of enablement at User Gems. What's going on at User Gems? I mean, mm -hmm. a lot. Uh, you got to figure out how to turn enablement to a strategic function and uh, roll out the coaching for all the revenue facing roles. But as far as what User Gems does, if you're interested in tracking your champions, uh, tracking movement and customer accounts, and making sure that you're selling to people that are familiar with you and are fond of you, uh, definitely check User Gems out. I love it. I love it. It's good to have you on, man. It's good to have you on. Well, so let, let, let's jump in. Obviously, the reason for this, this podcast, this whole series we're doing, um, you know, Voices of Enablement, is really to talk about tough times. I mean, it's tough times in enablement for a lot of people. Um, you know, the, the economic market is not ideal right now, if to, to say it in a nice way. And so, you know, a lot of, a lot of support functions are getting cut for budget constraints and things like that. And so, we just want to use this as a, as a place for people like yourself who are very experienced in enablement, who are doing some cool and creative things in, in the space to talk about how you're succeeding, what, what should others in enablement be thinking about when they're maybe joining new companies or you know, out in the hunt looking for, for new roles. And so to start it off, man, I just want to hear, you know, how do you think about enablement and elevating that within the C-suite, despite the fact that a lot of these support functions like enablement are, are really the first victims of, you know, rifts. How do you support enablement as a whole within an organization? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, I mean, I think you can kind of tell the difference even in the verbiage you just used. Like if your enablement department is seen as a support function, then yeah, you're going to be in trouble. Um, I think the first step is taking it to a strategic function. So what I mean by that is I think there's proactive enablement and there's reactive enablement. Let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. Let's say you run in a sales team, right? The RVP is like, you know, we're having a huge slowdown uh, in the mid funnel, which is actually something that we encountered at user jobs. If you're reactive in enablement, the manager of that team probably has a ton of stuff going on. They don't know why there's a slowdown necessarily. They're going to find topical information. They're going to listen, maybe a couple calls. They're going to be like, ah, like I heard this and I feel like, um, we're not setting agendas well. So now they're going to reach out to enablement and you, Hey, enablement, come here, come here, make, help me make a, a training around meeting agendas. Now there's no, there's no proof in that pudding, right? So in that case, this is why a lot of enablement departments are always on their heels mm. because they're just like a, 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 an appendix, basically, to whatever the whims of the sales team are. True. Now, let's, let's think about proactive enablement. I already know, if I'm looking at the data, that there's a slowdown in the mid-funnel. So I can check things like, what are the Salesforce reports suggesting? If I've been consistently scoring gong calls with the sales team, what area of the scorecard on those call types are we struggling with? Mm -hmm. If I'm actively coaching the reps and I've got a backlog of competencies that we're working on, generally what competencies are we lacking? Now I can come to the manager with solutions. Hey, based off of the data, it really seems as though we're not doing a good job storytelling the value of usage gems strategically. Here are some examples as to why. What you can see if you look at the data is that later in the funnel, the groupings are very tight, but in the mid funnel, they're quite loose, which means that that indicates most of our reps are not aware of the story they need to be telling. So what I propose mm -hmm. is this, and here's how we coach long-term. So you can flip the funnel, right? Instead of the managers coming to you, asking you for help, and it's already too late, you can get ahead of the problem and come proactively with solutions. And now you're not a support function because you're actually responsible for the ongoing coaching. I love that. Dude, it's so, it's so true. Um, so many things in there that I could unpack. Um, I'll say this, something we hear a lot <clears throat> is I feel like I'm just performing random acts of enablement. We hear it all the time. <laughs> yeah. That is, is that not uh, a, a function of being reactive and not proactive? I mean, that is, that is exactly what that is. That's exactly what that summarizes. You have all of these different things that's, that sales is asking for. 
sales leadership, even revenue leadership going, we need this, we need this, we need this, we need this. And instead of enablement, pushing that agenda or setting the tone, they're just acting to whatever is coming up. And so it's hundred percent reaction versus proaction. And I, I think that's, I think that's so true. So true. Well then, do, right, look, yeah, go ahead. No, nah, I mean, I think like you need a process in place with the team. Actually, I want to, I want to show you something an example of what we do here. Yeah. So the, the way that I work with our sales leader at Usagems is we have a consistent process for how we actually coach reps. So the first thing that our reps do every week, they leave feedback on their own call right? Mm -hmm. Why are they doing this? Because if I leave the feedback first, it's just me barking at you. If you leave the feedback first, you're driving introspection, the rep is saying things that I'm thinking. So they score their call. And then the assigned coach goes in, it could be me, it could be Derek. We score their call. Now we're going to host a live coaching session. So that's personalized to the rep. Hey, based off of this call, let's talk about some things that went down. The next step of this is we're going to tie this to active competency. So for example, I'm working with a rep right now and I'm working with him on agenda setting. So that call that we've gone over, we can talk about how that's occurred in that call, amongst other things. And he can provide proof of him trying this new thing out. Now, once that's done, the sales leader and I can review how we're progressing in these competencies. We can review how the advancement of those competencies is actually affecting conversion rates. And now, based off of what's happening for the whole team, we can host practice sessions. So this week, I'm hosting a practice session around how to involve new stakeholders in calls and you haven't talked to them before because we've seen this broadly across the team rep implements that change. And guess what? They're going to go back and score another call and we're going to see the progress of a time. So the reason you feel like it's random acts of enablement is because it is like you don't have a process in place where we're consistently coaching, reviewing and seeing how the data is affected. So of course you're on your heels. That's good. Yeah. I was going to ask uh, just a moment ago about what, what is revenue enablement's role in the success of an organization? And I think you just kind of mentioned it perfectly, which is to increase conversion rate, make our reps more effective, right? Yeah. So, oh my God, yeah. So how else? How else are you doing that? So that's obviously what you just showed is calls. That's the, that's your call review process. Whether it's agenda setting, whether it's overcoming objections, whether it's uh, you know asking the right questions at the right time, whether it's you know all of the different things that are included in in a kind of a, a synchronous conversation. But what about asynchronous conversation? What about over emails or you know prospecting effectiveness or um, you know getting getting the call scheduled for the next call and then actually getting in the resources when they need it you know to to enable that buyer to sell internally cuz you you and I both know sales is a lot less sales now it's a lot more project management so how 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 do you enable to to those aspects of the sales process not just the calls yeah i love that you asked that and a couple of ways that we approach that so the first way that we do it is we actually i don't want to say judge cuz i don't like that term but we evaluate our reps yeah. on a numeric scale let me show you what i mean Okay. So when I started at user gems, I built out with our sales leader, what are the competencies or what are like the qualities of the perfect rep? Some of these things are things that are on calls, but a lot of these things are things that are to your uh, quote in between the lines, right? Off yeah. nurturing, forecasting, multi-threading. So the three main data points that we look at when we're coaching reps when we're going over forecasts, what have you. The first is a tool called Atrium, which you can think of this as it's like Salesforce for dummies because I'm whack at creating Salesforce reports. I'm sure, sure you probably are too. Most people are. <laughs> yeah. So when I'm looking at the activity, one of some of the things that I'm thinking about are like the time and stage, right? This is going to tell us a story about how reps run deals. The second aspect of this is actually thinking about things like Gong Forecast. So we use Gong Forecast uh, to create our forecast meetings. When I'm looking at deals for reps and I bring these into my coaching sessions, now I'm looking at the activity within this deal, right? And you can even look at uh, data like responsiveness. So this is telling us outside the lines too. The mm -hmm. third thing that we're looking at are performance on calls. All of this creates a firmographic profile of the rep. So the perfect rep in our mind mm -hmm. is at a two for all of these. A two means like they're good. A one means needs improvement. A zero is like this is a focus area. So based out of the total possible, and there are nine of these, best score is 18. We want to make sure that we're maintaining at least a 12. And if we can do that, you're not going to make every rep the same, but you can continue to work on the glaring weaknesses while accentuating their strengths in deals. For example, we got a rep here. His name is Ben Havman. Shout out, Ben. He's one of the best reps I've ever worked with. This dude is absolutely incredible at selling next steps. Unbelievable at selling next steps. Like I, if I were on the call, I want to take the next step with this guy. <laughs> so I know that for a fact. Not every rep is going to run the deal the same way, but what I want to coach toward is accentuating those strengths on the call 
while taking the areas of improvement and figuring out how to tie those to those strengths. So I think a big part of customized coaching is understanding what the firmographic profile of the rep is and coaching to that rather than trying to make every rep the same through some methodology or whatever framework you want to use. So good. I, uh, I'm curious. So let's say Ben is the standard for getting next steps. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you take his calls in those moments of him getting to the next step as examples for the other reps to see, and then have them try to not like word for word, replicate what he's doing, but to use that as here's best practice. Can you learn from this? And then I want to see you improve in this area through this, this coaching. And then in doing so, I'm, I'm guessing you're tracking that through Atrium. Yeah. So Atrium and Gong, this is a great question as well. So I actually, I feel very strongly about this. Um, so anytime I roll out like a scorecard for a new goal, and this is going to happen a lot at startups because you're building out the sales process like as yourself. So for example, we just rolled out this call uh, where it's a data test review call. For user gems, you don't really have a demo because it's working in the background, but you want to use the data as the proof point. So before I roll anything out, right, I'm thinking about, all right, what does good look like on this call? So I want this to be delivered to them in workflow. So I type data test scorecard, right? That'll populate. We can take a look at it. Here's the thing. If I roll this out and there are no examples of what good looks like, it's not going to happen because I'm yeah. going to say it one time, the reps are going to hear it one time and they're going to go do their own thing. So anytime I roll anything out, the first thing that I want to think about is for each of those points, do I have an example that reflects how that can work? And you know, what's crazy about it is as I built out the sales process, different reps really shine at different parts, you know, of that scorecard. Yeah. So ultimately, look, it's unrealistic to think that reps are going to be a 10 in every category. It's never yeah. going to happen. Okay. Yep. A lot of reps, there are 10 in one category, there are four in one category, mm -hmm. there are six in another category. The ideal is through group learning, can I get all of my reps to be just about an eight in every category? Yeah. And it's so important now because now, like if you think about where startups are at, funding is tough to come by, right? We're not in a position where we can rely anymore. And what was it that Mark Benioff said? He was like 80% of Salesforce's revenue is like 50% of the reps, that's not going to fly anymore. It's just not, especially not for startups that aren't public yet. So we have to squeeze as much value out of the reps we have as possible. And I think the way to do that, to your earlier point, give examples of what goods like looks like, coach continuously at the micro level, customized to them, but at the macro level to trends that you see on the team. If you can do that, now you've got reps developing along the same path, but customized to their skill set. Yep. Yeah, we talk about it a lot over here. This, you know, a, a typical revenue org and their their revenue graph kind of looks like a bell curve in a lot of ways like if you were to chart the majority of reps you'd have the vast majority of reps sitting typically typically below quota or maybe just right mm -hmm. at quota you have a handful of reps that were probably candidly just bad hires and then you have a handful of reps who just crush it no matter what for whatever reason right they're just they're just closers it just it happens the goal is can you identify what you can do to make that call it 80 percent of those middle reps to push them to the right just a little bit, mm -hmm. right? And so how do you do that? You know, some people would say programs, you know, like we need, you know, sales coaching or sales training programs to move the needle. As a rep, I don't think it works. Some would say, you know, we need to level up our tech stack. Maybe in some scenarios, that's the case. But then what you're saying is actually, it's it's custom, it's custom coaching, which I, I'm gonna use that that language from now on. I think that's really good. Customized coaching for each rep, right? 100%. All of these reps could definitely gain something from something that is a program, right? There's probably something that all of them could glean from, but the vast majority of the progress is going to come when it's individualized. And I think we don't think about that a lot, actually. I know, I know my management in the past does, hasn't really thought about that a lot, right? I, I can't remember a time where I had an enabler or a, a sales manager, or anyone sit down with me and go, okay, these are the things that you do well. These are the things that you don't do well. Let's coach to the things that you don't do well. And this is how we're going to do that. Instead, it's always been, hey, Will, we're about to do this call, this cold call coaching session. Everyone's going to be there. Come join. <laughs> it's like 100%. Okay, that's yeah, really it's helpful. frustrating too, especially yeah. if you feel like it's a skill that you have. Like I always think about, um, I grew up in, like, I'm a long suffering New York Knicks fan, um, but I grew up yeah, watching and playing a lot of basketball. And it's the same thing as like if you, grew, if you play sports growing up, you probably remember like if you played a sport, let's say it was basketball. And you're the best three point shooter on the team. And the coach says, Oh, yeah, we're going to be practicing three pointers for the next week. You're like, Man, 
you know, yeah. next thing you know, you're out in the bleachers smoking pot. Like you're not, you're not interested. You're not interested. So with what you said, right? Like, here's what you're good at. Here's what you're bad at. You can even take that a step further. And this is actually why I, I don't score calls for the coaching sessions until the reps have. The real question is based off of what you know, you should be doing. What do you think you're good at? And what do you know for a fact you need to improve on? Because if you tell me that you're bored in immediately. If I come up to you and I'm like, yo, you get at this, you're not great at this. You might, you might rebuff me. And some reps do. There's some reps that are so competitive and so hot all the time. If you approach some of that type of stuff, they're like, man, you haven't closed in two years. Don't talk to me. Uh, but if they come to you and you put them in a position where they have to introspectively yeah. think about, okay, how can I improve my game? You have instant buy-in because reps, you're right. Reps don't like generalized training. Of course not. They do like opportunities to improve and make more money though. So put them in a position where they can drive that. I was literally about to ask you, how do you frame it? for a rep to want it, right? And obviously not every rep's gonna want it because we're all people, you know, some some people are stubborn as hell. Some people are coachable, some people aren't. I mean, it, that is definitely a personality trait that is not a fact of being a rep or not, right? But I am curious because most reps that I know, so by the way, I, I eventually wanna do a series where I bring sellers on here and ask mm. them about enablement. And yes. I just want candid feedback because I know what a lot of them are going to say, right? And so do you. you know, <laughs> you're not done. Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. So how how do you obviously making more money is incentivizing, but getting coaching, right, is it's not a direct correlation to making money, right? You would hope it is, but it's indirect, right? So how can you how do you make it like I don't know if it's a, it's a it's a matter of like fun or nothing like that, but how do you make it interesting enough for a rep to want it? Do you think about that a lot? I think about this every day and I'll tell you exactly how I think about it. Like you remember selling. I remember, I mean, I'm not that uh, far away from selling. It was only yeah. two years ago, but like selling is hard. Like there's no ifs, ands, and buts about it. The game is not easy. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, if you are in the selling game, it's not even about making more money. You want to improve so that it's not so difficult. Like think about how it. valuable it is if you can be in sales and you're so good at it that running the process is like automatic natural. for you. It's a free ATM. It's natural. So it's not really about like the money is a byproduct of improving to the point where the game slows down. And, and again, with the sports reference, there's no coverage you haven't seen. There's no coverage you haven't seen. So it's all easy to you. And if it's easy, it's great. Like what do sellers want to do the most? Just to sell. They don't want a ton of time figuring out, ah, like, what do I have to do next? Where do I get the resources from? Oh, like, what's the right document to send? What, how should I have responded to this question? No, no, no. Let's remove all that friction, give you the maximum time selling in the easiest, most conducive environment to doing it. And if you work with me and you improve your game, your environment is going to consistently be conducive to you closing easily, autonomously, and effectively. And that's what it's about. I'm the slow the game down. I <laughs> like that as a sports fan, that resonates a lot. Um, and it's to your point, it's the your end goal of training is not to make more money. Your end goal of training is to be able to do this in your sleep. And then a byproduct of that is you could go make more money. A hundred percent. I talk about this a lot. Like um, even when I first started at user gyms, you know, I always like to think, especially when you are creating a new department, you mm -hmm. want to start with like the vision and work backwards. I always say if you don't start with a vision, it's like dropping a ton of bricks and expecting it to just like sprout into a house. Like you got to give the frame what the house is going to be. And so I say all the time, like, Revenue leadership cares about you closing as much as possible. Mm -hmm. I care about you closing as autonomously and as effectively as possible. So for example, sales managers are looking at just like total close one for the quarter. That's great. I'm looking at the variability of closed Stage. deals. Like exactly. Like for me, it's about creating predictable revenue. And if you can do that, I think startups that are able to do that, they're going to survive this weird time because their burn rate's going to be low, their forecasts are going to be incredibly accurate, and the reps that they already have are going to improve to the point where they don't have to churn and burn and, you know, like get new reps in all the time. Because why would you as a rep leave a situation where you can close on pretty much autopilot? You're not. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I, I know we've talked about this a lot. One of the questions I was going to ask you is about, you know, what's the role of enablement in a, in a time like now when you're not hiring reps, right? New reps aren't coming in for most organizations. It's, it's a lot of, mm -hmm. a lot of old reps out, not a lot of new in. So what's the goal? Obviously, the goal is to increase effectiveness for each rep. A lot of this has to do with this like customized training and coaching that you're describing. But I really like the idea of can can we get our reps on autopilot in a good way? In a good in a way. Good way. Yeah. I like that. I like that a lot. Yeah. You know, some, something I mean, that I, I go ahead. No, you go ahead. I was gonna say something I was I was thinking about the other day, you know, 
GT and Buddy aside, but when it comes to how, how do you how do you quantify a, a, a really successful rep and an average rep outside of revenue creation? In my eyes, what, what I think about is who's winning the deals that they should win and who's losing mm -hmm. deals they should win. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think about this quite a bit. Um, you, you hear it and you see it. Like LinkedIn is a great example of this. Three biggest companies, I think, are three hottest companies right now. You're looking at Clary, you're looking at Gong, you're looking at Outreach. What are they all talking about? This revenue leak concept. Like ultimately, mm. you want to be in a position where you win all the deals that you should win. So yeah. when I think about reps that are like reps that I want to replicate, and a lot of enablement does come down to like replicating the best skills of your reps across all of the reps individually. Yeah, I mean, I think you want to win the ones that are clearly winnable. The ones that are tough to win, those are always going to be 50-50 balls. But the truth of the matter is like if your ICP is set and your marketing is good and the deals that are coming in are clearly geared toward actually buying your product, then your win rate should be pretty stable across the team. Yep. And if it's not, you want to evaluate why your absolute A player is doing what they're doing and now trickle that down. The reason that this doesn't happen is because if enablement is reactive, it's never going to happen. The managers do not have the time to psychoanalyze every rep on the team, break it down to data points, and then create the rollout across this over time. So I feel like for so many enablers, and I don't know why it is, like the reason I got into the industry was because like many reps, I saw bad enablement. I'm like, yo, like this, <laughs> this, they can't be serious with this. Like it can't, it can't go on like this. So I feel like for a lot of enablers, maybe like the industry is just so used to this idea of being a support role. We're Stockholm syndrome ourselves to continuing, but it doesn't have to be that way. And as a matter of fact, if you come in just like on a real deal, if you come with hypotheses, your prospect is going to respond to those and drive toward the hypotheses. If you don't, the deal is going to languish and slow down. So it's not so different. It's just enabling just selling outcomes internally. So, so, so good. Let me, I've never asked anybody this. Let me ask you this because you just, you said something that made me want to ask. Uh, what, what does bad enablement look like that you see way too much of? <laughs> I got a diagram just for this, actually. I'm gonna... Shut up. Yes. <laughs> oh, yes, I do. All right. So check this out. When I think of like a flywheel of enablement, it's got to be able to answer like a couple of questions consistently. If, if it doesn't, it's going to fall apart. It's going to rely on guesswork. So like at the center for me, and, you know, a lot of times people are like, um, what's the role of enablement if you're not hiring a lot of reps? To me, it doesn't matter if you're hiring a lot of reps or not. The very center of enablement should be coaching. That's what it is all about. The question is, how can you leverage that coaching into a consistency? So Let's say a training is delivered live, right? We need to be able to answer how are reps being delivered follow-up knowledge and assets. From there, you need to know, all right, now what types of questions are they asking around those knowledge and assets? Oftentimes, there's a training delivered asynchronously. So online, at this point, we need feedback on how they're conceptualizing that knowledge. And all of this leads back to them being on the phones uh, and answering how are they applying that knowledge and those assets. The analysis of that data, of course, leads back to what we coach on and the flywheel starts again. You'll notice that these are highlighted in color because the tools that I use for these are Gong with this lovely purple pink work ramp or seismic for like the e-learning aspect. And then something like a guru or a GTM buddy for these. Mm -hmm. So what does bad enablement look like a lot of the time? Like this, here's the ad hoc process where the, wow. where the manager is calling up enablement. Like, Hey, I saw a LinkedIn article on um, agenda setting. I think we should train on it. Live trainings to live at ad hoc to the reps, right? We can see their emails. We can see their calls. Fine. Some follow-up information exists in something like a notion or some wiki but there's no way to track content usage or searchability. So we can't assess the usability or the actioning of it. Mm -hmm. So if the information can't be found in Notion, questions asked in Slack. And you know, as well as I do, what happens once you start having full-on wikis in Slack? Oh, they're lost, dude. That's not getting looked they're at. They're done. Ever. They're done. And so the trail goes cold. So there's no feedback loop, right, as far as those follow-up questions. There's no data to drive what the follow-up learning should be. And because there's no specified follow-up learning, or process to do so like this, any follow-up training is now, ah, man, like I haven't slowed down to stage two. Uh, I just had a call with this one rep and you know what? He's not very good at uh, asking follow-up questions. So we're gonna have a training on that. This is very common for many companies. And it's oftentimes why enablement departments feel like they're in a support role. They are. Mm -hmm. So what we want to get to is a place called rep-centric enablement. And you'll notice the reps are at the center of this diagram as they should be. When the yes. live training is delivered, they're going to hit the phones. Right? We immediately know via Gong, how are they applying that knowledge? What areas of the scorecard are they doing well on? And we provide feedback just like this to one another on how that's going. Yeah. Right. From there, we want a revenue team knowledge base that allows us to see what type of search queries are coming through. So I always check 
the back end of Guru. I want to see what's being asked since we roll things out, what's giving them results, what's not giving them results. Yep. You know, it's funny. I was talking about how we just rolled out this new data test call. Look at the number two search over the past 90 days. It shouldn't be surprising, yep. right? And, I, and the best part is it's producing results. Cool. Yep. Once we analyze the feedback from that, this drives the strategy for what's going forward. Are they doing well on the calls? Are they finding a lot of information? Great. If we do another live training, it's going to be in those one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions. Maybe it's a situation where what they're not doing is a process thing that I can teach them via video. So maybe I do a lighter touch online training. The feedback from all of these data points now drives the data to assess the level of conceptual understanding and the flywheel starts again. So you need to have a consistent rolling process. Otherwise, it's always going to be ad hoc. So this is what I think good enablement looks like. And some of the outcomes of this, you know, you're going to increase the active selling time. You're going to decrease the selling friction back to our point about the game slowing down. And finally, the feedback loops and analytics allow you to proactively understand the areas of success and the potential gaps, which means the enablement strategy is based on rep performance and rep performance alone, rather than what some sales leader found in a HubSpot article last night. So true. Yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna say, uh, you know, I talk to enablement leaders five times a day. Um, unfortunately, somewhat often, I feel like they feel like they are tool governors, right? We rolled out this tool, and 75% of our job is to just make sure reps use it. And I'm like, yeah, that is so wrong, right? That is so wrong. That is not what you should, you should be putting the reps in the middle before you buy the tool and figuring mm -hmm. out, is this a tool that they need? First of all, second of all, how can we enable them in the moment right now, maybe without a tool before we start to talk about tools? And then oh, when yeah. we do buy a tool, let's make sure that it, it's seamlessly in their workflow. So we're not worried about governing this tool. Instead, we can focus on the coaching which is exactly what you're saying. I love it. I freaking love it. I wish I wish it was more consistent across the board. I, I will say I'm finding there seems to be a, what's the best way to put it? Um, there's a revolution in enablement, it feels like, in a lot of ways that I am, I'm hearing different messaging and verbiage today than I was hearing 10 months ago. It feels like enablement is becoming a little bit more succinct in what they think and what they want to measure and how they want to do it versus 12 months ago, it was all over the place, dude. I'm saying I was hearing my priority right now is focused on buying an LMS. Yeah. And I'm like, what? Are you kidding? Yeah. And then um, we're wondering say, why, like so many people in enablement are, are getting cut. Like, listen to what you just said. Like if I were a CEO, that's the first thing I would cut too. Um, so like, there's gotta be a revolution in enablement because if there isn't, there's not gonna, I mean, there will be, there's always going to be some level of enablement at companies, but if the enablement profession does not adopt to putting the reps, the variability and the outcomes at the center rather than the governance, they're not going to be any enablement job. So the enablers that are going to survive are the people that make that adaptation, or hopefully if you're an enabler, it's always been that way. There's no change that's necessary. But if you are in a situation where you've been thinking about governance, you're thinking about it the wrong way. Like the governance or whatever you bring on is a byproduct of what the reps need and how the reps are producing not the other way around. Like your governance is not what's driving the rep performance. Your coaching is what's driving the rep performance. And based off of their workflow, now we can think about governance. 100%. So good. Let me ask, I got two more questions for you. <clears throat> One is how, how close do you have to be to rev ops? It's like a lot of the stuff you're saying is very rev ops, right? It's very like data, very integrated in like CRM and other systems and then using that data to drive decisions. That's a very RevOps kind of thing, right? That's at least that's how I think about it. So how, A, does user gyms have a, a RevOps function? I'd imagine so. And if so, how how succinct are you? Are you guys in lockstep? Are you, are you meeting with them on a regular basis? What does that look like? Yeah, so we do have a VP of RevOps. We also have uh, this person on the RevOps team and the head of RevOps, his name is Joss Poulton. He's actually like one of my favorite people at user gyms. Awesome. He's Love probably it. the best RevOps leader I've ever worked with. So, um, so two two ways to answer this. Do you have to be in lockstep with RevOps? At times, yes, especially when you're thinking about like major rollouts, things like updates to pricing, um, updates to a certain function within the sales process, for sure. It also depends on how good you are or what tools you have to derive data. So I'm very fortunate to have Atrium, which does a lot of the dashboarding for me. Uh, yeah. But if I didn't, then I would absolutely. I think the closer that enablement is to RevOps, the better. And I also think that's why like, I'm in a position where I report straight to the CEO, right? So it's a little different. But that's why we're seeing a ton of enablement is now rolling up to like the VP of RevOps. It makes total sense because the data is what is validating 
whether what you were doing is working or in a proactive sense, where you should be focusing your time. So enablers out there that are not in a position where they can derive their own data themselves, the closer you are to RevOps, the more you're going to be able to substantiate the value of whatever it is you're doing. So good. Yeah, I, I am seeing more of a trend for big, big, uh, I would say, banner that this is happening is that a lot of organizations are dropping sales enablement from the title and it's now revenue enablement, right? Because they're now moving to support customer success, account management, as well as obviously pre-sales. Um, and so you're seeing, at least I'm seeing kind of, an, again, another evolution, this evolution of enablement being closer tied to RevOps and their, the CROs, a lot of their reporting into versus sales leadership, or even sometimes like marketing, like product marketing or whatever, like product marketing is a function that I think is very important in, in the enablement space, but I'm seeing them being a little bit more separated than maybe they once were, which is interesting to me. We'll, we'll see how that kind of evolves over time. I think product marketing needs to be heavily involved in a lot of the like content uh, and enablement content that is being produced, but we'll see how that goes. But I'm curious, um, if, you, if, if you were looking for an enablement role today, Okay, and you're you're let's say you're interviewing at a bunch of different places. What are the red flags that you would say mm, probably not a type of organization that I want to run enablement in? Versus, what would you say? Oh, this organization gets it. It's clear to me. They do this. People talk about this. They have these people in place. Whatever whatever the the case is. What are the things that you would be looking for, either as validation or as again red flags to to avoid? Yeah, well, I think, you know, that the flip side of the validation are going to be the red flag. So the first thing that I would think about, um, enablement is only as good as your cross-functional partners. There are talkers and there are doers. Mm -hmm. I would be trying to scope out for sure, like revenue enablement. I want to meet with the head of the sales development team. I want to meet with the head of the sales team. And I want to meet with the head of customer success. Now, I want to assess how important they think coaching is to their team as far as ongoing development. And I want to assess whether they have a grasp of the areas of improvement within their own cycles and processes today. That's A. B, you want to see what the level of buy-in is going to be because ultimately like the way to scale enablement is not to hire a team of 10 enablers, which a lot of people do. The way to scale it is getting the managers and the team involved in their own like coaching and development. And then you can keep your enablement team pretty lean if you do that. So the other thing you want to think about is how do they respond to being led by someone that doesn't necessarily have the authority to lead? That's B. Things that would drive me away. Um, I think, first of all, you want to be cognizant of where enablement like rolls up to. Like to your point, if I'm at an organization and enablement rolls up to product marketing, that indicates to me like the idea of like coaching and training and development is probably pretty limited like i think those organizations look at all right like enablement is going to be responsible for the handoff of all of these materials and basically just synthesizing them down into bullet points you're going to be the first person to get cut if things True. hit the fan that's exactly. like i guarantee that um so i think to that point some red flags are like how strategically does the organization view enablement as a function if they view it as a reactive thing then you've got to evaluate whether you can get in there and change their perspective but if they see it as a proactive thing, so for me, like the same deck that I, when I was interviewing a long time ago, the same deck that I just showed, like I came to the interviews with, I was like, look, this is how I see it. Here are the core benefits. Here's why. Um, I think if you come with a plan and people react well to it, you're in a good place. Um, so maybe whether it's red flags or whether it's uh, green lights, you need to come as an enabler to these interviews with a very firm plan around what you are going to do and the business level outcomes it is going to affect. And if the people like that, then you're in a good spot. If they don't get it, it's probably not right for you. Such good advice. Again, Again to proactivity. That's it. I was about to say it. Yep. Proactive versus reactive. That's what we got to be. Braxton, this is awesome, dude. I appreciate it. I, uh, I, I knew we'd go over. I knew we would. And we could keep going. <laughs> we could absolutely. I'm we sure we could talk could. about this for, for hours. But man, I, I really appreciate it. Uh, I think our viewers are going to get a lot from this. I, I did. Candidly. I, I thought that was the, the graphs that you have are spot on money. I think. Those need to those need to make their way around all the enablement communities um, because I think that is that is where it's headed. Is this like rep centric enablement? This like custom coaching idea I think is super super good. Um, and and as a rep myself, I'm excited about what you're saying, right? And I would argue that most reps don't typically get excited about what the enablement functions 
are saying. No. Just... <laughs> no. <Yeah. laughs> hey, neither did I when I was a rep. I, I completely get it. I totally yeah. do. <laughs> yeah. Well, dude, thanks again. Um, let's, uh, let, let's stay in touch. I want to have you on again at some point. Yeah, hey, you know where to find me at. And uh, to anyone listening to this, if, if any of it was interesting to you, hit me up on LinkedIn. I'm around. Yes. I'm happy to get together and chat. Absolutely. All right, Braxton. Take care, man. See you later.